Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this webinar. We will uh, get started in a second. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen. Yeah, I think everybody can see, hopefully you can see the ViewPath TV homepage. Um, yes, I can. Great. Thank you, Eve. Just set up my environment here a little bit. Okay, so uh, I think we'll just uh, get straight into it. We have uh, a good number of people here. Thank you for joining. Uh, so uh, as you know, since you signed up for this webinar, uh, uh, today we're going to be focusing on gene pages. So we're gonna do a deep dive. Uh, I'm gonna take um, one example gene page. I'll use one in ToxoDB, but then I'll hop around between PlasmaDB and TritripDB. And, and if we have time, I can jump onto other uh, resources just to highlight different sections of the gene page. Before I get started, uh, my name is uh, Omar Harp and uh, I work for the ViewPath TV project. I'm joined today by um, uh, Evelina Basenko, who is uh, also part of the outreach team. Uh, she'll be answering questions in the background or, or letting me know if there are any questions that come up that uh, need to be answered um, uh, uh, live. So, um, and that comes to the uh, asking questions. If you do have questions, uh, in your uh, go to webinar control panel, there should be a question and answer um, uh, section, so or a question section. Just type your question there, and uh, this way it's logged, and we can uh, keep track of it, um, and then we'll answer them. Um, okay, so um, again, in case you are not familiar, uh, ViewPathDB, the eukaryotic pathogen vector and host informatics resources. Um, is funded primarily by uh, the uh, NIAD, so National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, but we also do get funding from other resources. In particular, it's important to mention the Wellcome Trust in the UK, uh, where they fund various aspects of the of the project, um, uh, and and um, and in particular, they funded many of the components, some of the components that were added to uh, ViewPath TB, such as TritripDB and, and FungiDB. Um, ViewPathDB itself is a is the uh, what we call the portal or the parent uh, database, but it includes multiple different uh, resources. Uh, these resources, as you can see here in the icons on the bottom, uh, support different organisms. And the way to imagine these resources is that they are basically a skin um, on sort of or a view of ViewPathDB. Uh, filtered down to the organisms of interest. So for example, uh, this icon here takes you to AmoebaDB. If I click on this, it opens up AmoebaDB, which as you can see, it looks very similar um, to ViewPathDB. It's the same architecture. The only difference now is that you're only looking at organisms that fall under the AmoebaDB cluster. So, uh, so anything you learn on any of these resources can be done uh, on the other resources, because they're all built on the same infrastructure and they have the same look and feel. Um, one other thing to note is that ViewPathDB is one of two bioinformatic resource centers. Uh, so ViewPathDB, as mentioned, focuses on eukaryotic pathogens, vectors, and hosts. Uh, the other informatics resource uh, is called BVBRC, and that focuses on bacteria and viruses. They have some very nice tools, so if you also work on bacteria and viruses, or viruses, um, I encourage you to go to that resource for um, uh, to use their tools. Um, in addition to uh, the main genomics resources, we also have a database called OrthoMCL, and this database is used for um, defining orthology. We use it heavily in our resource, and we have many other webinars and tutorials that walk you through how you can leverage OrthoMCL. I'll, I'll mention it briefly today, as I look at the gene page, since the gene page also includes uh, a section on orthology, which uh, relies on the analyses done by OrthoMCL. Two other resources you may be interested in are ClinEpiDB and MicrobiomeDB. Uh, these resources focus on, on slightly different aspects of uh, human health. Uh, ClinEpiDB uh, integrates uh, various epidemiologic data sets, uh, describes the data, and allows you to, um, uh, to explore the data. Uh, it's a really cool resource. Uh, MicrobiomeDB, uh, equally so, uh, built on the same infrastructure, allows you to explore uh, uh, microbiome data sets, large microbiome data sets. 
Um, and so both of these data sets are, are pretty nice. And again, I would encourage you to explore them. They have a lot of help and resources. Another thing uh, to point out before we get into the gene pages is that on any of our resources, if you need more help, there's a help link at the uh, top menu bar here. If you click on this, you can select from the options down here, including learn how to use ViewPathDB. And when you open this up, it takes you to a page which includes uh, many different uh, buttons, including an FAQ, frequently asked questions. So sometimes it's great to go here very quickly and see if your um, if your question was answered elsewhere. And and these you can expand these, and all of these have additional information uh, depending on the on the question. There may be images integrated here that walk you through the answer to this particular question. Um, Another important uh, aspect here is to point out that all of our webinars are recorded, just like today's webinar. It's being recorded and it'll be shared with you. Uh, and you can explore previous webinars. So I might point you to previous webinars today because many of the items I'll describe have been described in more detail um, in previous webinars. They're all recorded, available here, uh, and you can access them on YouTube in our YouTube channel. So you're, you're welcome to explore them here or you can go directly to our YouTube channel uh, there's a link up here at the upper right hand corner of the website and you can go and explore our channel and, and uh, see what else is available to you. And the last thing I'll tell you about uh, this learning how to use VPAD2B section is that we also have links to all of our workshops. So any previous workshops that we that we hold or future ones which you may be interested in, in learning about, we provide you with all the exercises. So for example, I'm just taking you to this virtual workshop which was held last September. Uh, some descriptions here at the top. And as you go down, you'll see here that we have uh, various sections, links to exercises, and also any recordings that were taken during that particular uh, workshop. And so you can, uh, you know, asynchronously uh, go through this and take some of these exercises and watch the YouTubes that go along with them uh, in case you're interested in learning more about a particular section. Okay, so I'm going to. Um, jump to ToxoDB here. And um, I'm gonna start by, uh, uh, and we're gonna, you know, today we're gonna take a deep dive into uh, gene pages. So I will start by, you know, navigating to a gene page. So how, how do you get to a gene page? And so there are many ways of doing that. One way is you can just search for a particular um, uh, gene name, right? So for example, if I'm interested in uh, Aurora kinases, right, I can start typing Aurora right here. And I could stop and I could just run this. So any any kinase with the word Aurora would, would uh, or any, any, um, uh, any item in the database, we call them records, any record in the database that has the word Aurora associated with it will come back. And if you look here at this filter on the left, you will see that it came back with genes. There are 256 of them. And also it came back with compounds. There are four compounds in the database that have the word Aurora in them. So depending on what you're interested in, you may be you may want to filter your results. In our case, we're going to be doing a deep dive into gene pages. So I'm going to select genes. And now um, I'm down to 256 genes. But of course, these are many, many genes. So I may want to filter these further and look for genes in ME49, which is one of the toxoplasma strains. So uh, no reason to worry about this. Uh, and so I'm going to apply this filter. And so now I'm looking only at the um, eight genes that came back that somehow uh, were filtered when I typed uh, MB4A. I must have some other weird filter applied. Let's clear this again and try it again and apply. Okay, so here are the, all the MB49 ones. And I'm just going to go ahead and uh, select that first one. And if I click on this, it's going to take me, oh, apologize about it, ignore this. Uh, so it's going to take me to the uh, gene page. Okay, so this is the gene page. Uh, the way you can imagine the gene page, it is a um, uh, basically an encyclopedic view of everything we have in the database about this particular gene. And I'm going to walk you through this gene page slowly, um, and and we'll hopefully learn uh, something together about this particular gene. So another way you can access uh, genes is from searches. So um, actually two, two searches I'll show you. So one is this, if you remember the way I, I came to this gene is by looking for a word and then finding the gene of interest. But also it might be that you actually have the ID. So let's say I had 
this ID. I know exactly which gene I want to go to. I can just type the ID up here and run it, and it gives you a search result. But here it, it gives it focuses on that particular gene because anytime you search with a gene ID, if it exists in the database, we give you this focused view here. And so we know this is the gene ex itself, and so we'll go ahead and um, and select it. Um, so now um, what happens is now I'm, I, I came to this gene, uh, and we can explore it further. I'm going to show you one more way you can get to genes, uh, and because I think it's uh, it's quite useful. And that's if you have a list of gene IDs. And so I'm just going to go to, I have a list of gene IDs right here. So let's go ahead and uh, select them. So I'm going to copy them back to the database. And now I'm going to run a search. And the search I'm going to run is for a search for IDs. And you'll notice here, I'm going to search for genes. And there's one called list of IDs. That looks like the one I want, because I want to search for a list of IDs. And then right here, I'm just going to paste my list of IDs and get answer. So this is a really cool, because this allows you to, um, uh, to uh, take a, a list of IDs that you have, for example, from an experiment that you ran in the lab, like a proteomic experiment, or a microarray experiment, or an RNA-seq experiment, take your genes of interest, and then ask additional questions about them. So now I can add more steps here and expand this search strategy. I won't go into this. We have a, a webinar that we ran a, a couple of months ago uh, that is available to you um, that goes uh, takes you into a deep dive of how to actually construct one of these search strategies. And I highly recommend you to um, view it because I think that's this is one of the most powerful tools in our databases where you can integrate results from different types of analyses and searches to develop new hypotheses. OK, so let's go back. I'm going to go back to my search results and go back to this particular gene. Um, this error that you're that I'm seeing here, unfortunately, there's I updated my operating system, and that's causing an error. But um, uh, there's supposed to be a patch for it very soon. So I'm back at this Aurora kinase gene page. And as you can see here, I'm, uh, I'm going to scroll down slowly. You'll see here, this is the gene ID. Uh, again, if you're not familiar with gene IDs, a gene ID is basically a unique, unique identifier. It's the, <clears throat> it's like the uh, social security number if you're in the U.S. or it's your your ID, identity number if you live in, in other countries. It's sometimes called that, but basically, it's a unique ID that this gene alone has, right? And so, this is the only gene in the database that has this ID, and super important. Obviously, it's nice to be able to uniquely identify um, a particular gene. Um, then right here, we have what's called the product description. So in this case, it's called Aurora kinase. This product description, you have to think about where this product description came from. Sometimes this came from a, a, a manually curated and annotated gene. Sometimes it comes from homology to another gene that was annotated as Aurora kinase. Uh, sometimes it comes from other automated analyses. Um, and the, the accuracy of this is it depends on where it's coming from, right? So it's important to keep this in mind. So just because a gene is called aurora kinase, maybe it's not an aurora kinase, right? Maybe it was misannotated somewhere else and this was just copied over. So it's super important to always think about, well, what does my gene look like? Does it have the components that an aurora kinase has, right? Does it have a kinase domain, for example? Minimally, you would expect to have that. Um, and there are ways you can, you can search for that and I'll show you where they are on the gene page. We'll get to that uh, during this webinar. OK, so uh, the next thing to notice here is this section right here. This section includes different information about the gene. For example, uh, it's a protein coding gene. OK, that's great. It's located on chromosome 7A. So that tells you its, its location and which chromosome. Um, it shows you its, its exact coordinates. So not only the, that it's on chromosome 7A, but the exact nucleotide position of this gene and on which uh, orientation of this gene. Um, the next thing, uh, obviously, the species, uh, Toxoplasmaglandia, ME49. We know this already, but it's, it's here already. And the other thing is that it's, it's a reference strain. So a reference strain, when it comes to our databases, simply means it's a strain or the species that we, or organism, that we align all of the functional data to. Right. So you could imagine, for example, in, in Toxoplasma, I think there are 16 annotated strains of Toxoplasma gondii, uh, but we don't align all the data to all of them. Um, that'll be just too duplicative, and, and they're, for all intended purposes, almost identical in their, in their or they should be almost identical in their annotation. Um, and so 
for historical reasons, ME49 was the reference strain, and that's where all the data gets mapped to. This way, now you can compare things in a single organism um, from different uh, data sets. So moving down here, you'll notice there are two, these are quick links. Uh, one is called view two user comments on this gene or add a comment. Okay, so we'll, we'll get to that section. So, so we have a mechanism where you can add a comment on any gene. Um, and that's, that's a highly useful way to contribute your knowledge to the community. Um, and then the other one is this ability to, to update the annotation and so we have a, a mechanism for you to use a tool called Apollo, where you can fix cor and correct gene models, or you can also, um, uh, uh, you know, add annotation uh, in Apollo so it can get integrated into the, um, uh, the official annotation uh, at some point down the road. Um, and if you're interested in, um, you know, how uh, we update our official annotation and ways to do that, I would encourage you to watch our webinar from last week, which focused on updating the Toxo, uh, coincidentally, or focused on, on updating the Toxoplasma gondii MB49 genome. And so we had some nice discussions there with the community about our plans and also ways for um, the community to uh, change the annotation. Okay, before I move down, uh, there are some shortcuts here, these icons. These take you to different sections of the gene page that, um, that we deemed as, as important uh, again this is arbitrary you know we kind of thought oh it'll be i think people will be interested in synteny maybe they're interested in snips there's transcriptomic data so we have a quick way for you to get to those sections and if you click on any of these it's going to take you down on the gene page to that section um, instead of doing that i'm not going to jump around i'm going to sort of scroll down the gene page slowly and walk through different sections so we won't use these shortcuts but but obviously you're welcome to if that's exactly if you know exactly where you want to go so I'm gonna start scrolling down here and we'll start coming to our first section. And uh, the other thing, hopefully you noticed that on the left here now, there's a, a menu of all the sections on the gene page. You can expand all of these, right? And you'll see that each category like gene models, for example, has multiple subcategories. And you'll see here we're in the gene model section and there are multiple uh, subcategories that all fit under, under this here. And you'll notice there's this little arrow here so this allows you to expand the section. So and this is very tricky, right? It's, it's, it's hard. Most of these sections are, are closed by default because our pages are, gene pages are dynamic and the sections will load automatically when you open that section. Uh, otherwise the gene pages will become super slow if, if we have all the sections open by default. Um, and so, but the nice thing about it is that you can go to any section you want, click on this little arrow and explore it. And in fact, I would encourage you if you are working on a specific gene, whatever database it is, make sure you go to that gene and, and you should just spend some time and explore every single section of your gene of interest uh, because you might find some really interesting information there that you weren't aware of before. Okay, the other thing you can do, um, as I, if you notice here, there's a little dot. This dot indicates where you are on the gene page. We're in the gene model section. You know, if I move down, you'll notice that the dot will move now. I'm in the annotation uh, and curation section. Let's go back to the gene model section. There we go. Um, the other thing to notice, this menu allows you to select sections or unselect sections that you don't want to see. So, for example, if you never care about gene models, that's not something in you, and you don't really want to see them on the gene page, you can customize your gene page. So I can click this, and now the gene model section has disappeared. I can also take away, let's say, the annotation. Let's say I'm not interested in that. And let's say I'm not interested in taxonomy, you can take that out. And so now all of these sections will disappear and that's remembered in your cookies. And so the next time you come back, this, they should have the same configuring of, configuration of the gene page. I'm gonna turn these back on since we're interested in for this webinar. Okay, so here they come back. Uh, the other thing about this menu item or uh, uh, menu on the left, is that you have this filter table. And this is a common theme throughout all of our databases. We have these, um, uh, this ability to filter um, uh, whatever table you're looking at. In this case, we're looking at a table of, uh, of, of uh, contents. And so now I can go in here and let's say I'm, I'm interested in finding um, uh, RNA-seq data. I can just start typing RNA-seq and now all of a sudden it tells me, oh, there's a transcriptomic section and transcript expression, that's where I'll find RNA-seq. And then I can, if I click on this, it's gonna take me down to that section on the gene page, okay? So I can un 
uh, remove this and I can quickly, there's a little arrow here on the bottom right, which allows me to quickly go back up to the top of the gene page. Okay, so now let's take a look at this gene, uh, at the gene model. Uh, so you'll notice here that uh, it's telling me that this gene has one exon, it has one transcript. A gene can have more than one transcript, obviously, if it's alternatively um, uh, transcribed. Um, and then as we move down, you'll see here this gene model section, which I expanded, and it shows you the genome browser view for this gene. And remember, this gene had one exon, and what we're seeing here is one big uh, box, basically, or a rectangle. That's my, my, my gene, and it's a single exon. There are no introns in there. If you look at the gene that's upstream of it, or on the left-hand side, you'll notice that this gene has multiple introns, these little lines that connect these rectangles together, and we can count these exons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This gene has seven exons. Another thing to notice here about this is that the, these gene colors are, are different. One is um, blue and one is red. Um, and these simply signify the orientation of the gene, on which strand of the DNA this gene is, is encoded. And so you can see this gene here at the, on the left goes from left to right. It also, there's a little arrow here at the end of it to also signify the direction. And the gene we're interested in, our kinase, is going from right to left. And the other thing to note about these genes, you'll notice that there's these white rectangles on the right-hand side and left-hand side of the gene. These are UTRs, so the untranslated uh, regions of the gene. So there's a five prime UTR and a three prime UTR. These are not annotated for every single gene. Uh, and also it depends on the, um, on the organism. The annotation of these is, is not, not very straightforward and, and, and often um, not available, but when available, we do include them um in uh, the gene model and uh, again as i mentioned before you can annotate this gene using apollo and you'll see here there's a link to apollo and if you're interested in annotating a gene using apollo there we have lots of uh, tutorials and, and last week's one has some quick uh, tutorials on how to do this um, you can uh, click on annotate this gene in apollo and you can add utrs to a gene for example if you know that a gene has specific utrs and and, and you want to indicate this Okay, this view here is coming from the gene from from our genome browser. We use a genome browser called JBrowse, and you could go to that genome browser by clicking on View in JBrowse. Again, we have webinars that are dedicated just to the genome browser, and I would encourage you to to explore these. We'll probably have another webinar coming up soon where we'll we'll um, uh, cover the genome browser again, uh, and uh, we will uh, post that obviously on our website and on social media, and so you'll you'll hopefully know that um, this webinar is coming up uh, but the genome browser allows you to visualize data just like we're looking here and if i scroll down you'll see there's a lot of data here and you can load many other data sets in uh, in the genome browser if you go to the genome browser this is just a customized view on the gene page pertaining to things that we thought are important for gene models there are many other types of data that might be important for gene models which you would want to go to the genome browser and turn them on and work with them there so um, a couple of other things to note. There is a community annotation track in this gene model section. And you will see here that on the right-hand side of this gene, of our aurora kinase, they are in the official annotation, there are two genes. Okay, But you'll notice here that the community annotation, there's an annotation or a new gene model here that covers both of these genes. So most likely, or not most likely, that's probably the case here, that these two were erroneously annotated in the official annotation, they should be really part of a single gene. This data is coming, not coming from nowhere, it's coming from real evidence, real RNA sequence data. So as I scroll down, this is a track that combines all of the RNA sequence data that we have in the database. And you'll notice here that there is expression uh, for this gene and there's evidence that, that, that maybe this gene is, um, encompasses the whole area. And as we scroll down, you can see, for example, for this gene on the, on the left side, you will see that there's some really good exon evidence. Wherever there is a peak, that means that there's expression. And when there's a trough, that means that there's no expression, most likely an intron. And we also have an additional track here, which is really unique to ViewPathDB resources, where we take any read that spans an intron, or uh, yeah, spans um, an intronic region. So reads coming from the RNA, from the exons, basically, because that's what what's becomes RNA. 
that had to be split when we mapped it back to the genome. So those become evidence for the existence of this intron. And so anytime we have reads that, that support this, we include them here and you can click on this and actually get more information. And so, you know, you can quickly see that this particular intron is supported by 2020 reads, right? So it has some really good support uh, for this uh, for this intron to be, uh, to be there. And so you could be very confident that this intron is correct, right? Uh, same thing, if you look at the, the Aurora kinase, you'll see that there's no evidence for any introns in it. So you could be confident that most likely this gene model is, is correct. Okay, so I'm going to start moving down, and as, as you probably can imagine, we can spend a whole section just looking at the genome browser and a whole webinar, and we will do that um, in the coming future. So moving down, you'll notice here you can um, open a GFF format of this particular gene. Uh, so uh, I mean, I'll just open it in a, in a separate page. Um, and if we look here, this is the GFF format. So for certain applications, you may want the GFF format, which includes information about where the exons are, where the coding sequence is, where the, uh, you know, where the messenger RNA is, what is the annotation, gene IDs, and, and many other information, the coordinates, for example. This is specifically for this gene. We also have, obviously, GFF files for the entire genome. So depending on what you're interested in, uh, you know, we, we actually have that, that data. One thing I didn't mention to you earlier that anytime you're working on either on a gene page or running searches and you're get, you're stuck or you're not sure where to find something and you you know I encourage you to contact us. So if you click on the contact us link here, it opens up a form where you can quickly go in, type your information and uh, type your message here and submit it. It gets logged into our tracking system and um, one of the outreach team will um, uh, respond to you within 48 hours or so. Okay, so let's keep moving down. We have a section called transcripts, and I'm just going to open these one by one and so we can explore these further. Some of these sections you might find, oh, well, this is not terribly interesting, so I don't care about it. But this one just tells you that this has a transcript. This particular gene, this Aurora kinase, has a transcript. It's one exon. This is the transcript length. This is the protein length, and it's a messenger RNA. So nothing nothing magical here, uh, So, uh, but, it's, but in some cases, it might be useful for you, depending on what you're doing. So let's move down. You'll see here there's the community annotation from Apollo. For this gene, we know there aren't any because there wasn't a community annotation track uh, gene for this particular gene. Um, so there's there is no information here, which is fine. Uh, the product description, again, this is the product description that was at the top of the uh, page as well uh, and where it came from. So now you can see if we have this information, we include it. So you can see this came from GenBank. So this came from the, the annotation that we loaded. Uh, alternative product descriptions. So Sometimes the gene was called something else at some point. So maybe it wasn't an Aurora kinase. It was called maybe a something, whatever, upregulated kinase one or something. And so that would be, if we have that information, we load it right here. Um, if it has a gene name, like AUR1, for example, we would have it. This one does not have a gene name. Um, names, previous identifiers, and aliases. This is very useful because often uh, gene IDs change over time when annotations are updated. Uh, and you can see here, this particular uh, gene has many different alternative uh, gene IDs. Um, and so, for example, these were old gene IDs in, in ToxoDB. Uh, so if, if our system is working properly, I'm going to give it a test. So I'm going to copy this gene. I'm going to paste it in the search up there. And now it found me the same Aurora kinase that we we're looking at. So that's good. So that means this is, uh, this is working. And so we will, uh, we will continue moving along. Okay, so these are nice and useful. So anytime you have old gene IDs uh, and we have them, we map them back to the official uh, genome and, and then become available in the, in the searches. If we have notes from the annotators, they're available here. And so you can see there are some notes here and these may be useful to you. Um, and then we have this user comment section. And so I'm gonna open it up. And again, let me actually scroll back up to the top of the page. Remember, up here we have this view to user comments or add a user comment. If I click on this section, it's gonna take me down to this user comment section. And you will see here that two people added user comments about this gene. Um, and those are, those are people like you in the community. These were not added by an expert curator. These are added by, by uh, scientists out there who work um, on these uh, genes. These people in particular work on these genes. So they did a couple of things that provided information. So I'm gonna go and, and, and visit one of these user comments in more detail. Um, and so I open it up in a new tab. So here's the, uh, the user comment that I clicked on. 
And you'll see here, there's the content. They added some information about this gene, which may or may not be useful to you, but it is, it is extra information. Um, they included a PubMed ID, which allows you then to go quickly to PubMed uh, and see the paper that they were talking about. They added two PubMed IDs in particular. And then if you scroll up, somebody else, that was the second comment that was added um, to this particular gene. OK? OK. Double check and make sure there aren't any questions. So again, if you do have any questions, feel free to type them in your in the question and answer session, uh, in the question section of um, uh, GoToWebinar. Okay, so let's move down. Actually, one thing I'm going to collapse this uh, this menu because I'm not actually going to use them today. So let's collapse it. So this gives us a little bit more real estate to work with. Um, and so now I'm going to look at the linkouts right here. So linkouts are links to other databases where this gene or the sequence was uh, is present. And so this is a quick way if you want to go to um, RefSeq, for example, or Entree Gene or, or Uniprot, uh, we have links directly from, uh, from the gene page. Genomic location, this should not be a surprise. We already saw it all the way in the top. We have the, the chromosome, the location, uh, the organism variation, and then you could also view it in the genome browser straight from here. Literature, if you open this up, if we have any, it'll show up here. You'll notice that that our, our, there are there were some publications available in the user comments, but they're not available in the literature. So we are working on a mechanism to update this literature section coming from user comments. Uh, and so uh, stay tuned for this. Um, but again, these PubMed IDs, as you can imagine, it's not straightforward to add these, right? Either somebody has to tell us this publication goes with this gene, or we have to have a automated way, or you know, we could have a, a somebody who goes through the genome and manually does it one by one, but that's very costly. Or you can imagine having an auto way of, of of text mining uh, the literature to pull in gene IDs, and and we are working on on methods to do this, but of course they all have um, caveats, so they're not not as straightforward as one would think. Uh, but one goal is for any user comment associated that associates a PubMed ID with it that we also included in the literature section. The nice thing about the user comments is that uh, they are already there, so in a, in a way. And um, one thing to point out about these user comments, if you enter a user comment, so I am logged in right now, so I can, I can click on add a user comment, and I can start adding a user comment. And as soon as I add the comment, it will literally takes maybe five seconds. And then when I go back to the gene page, it'll show up in the user comment section, and it'll allow me to, um, um, and, and then, after it shows up in the user comment section, it also becomes searchable, right? So for example, I can go in here and say, I'm gonna search by this person's name. They may have added more than one user comment, but we can search by the name Goodman. And you'll see here, these are all genes that it's finding the word Goodman in the user comment field, right? And so clearly this person has added multiple user comments, which is really, really great. Um, but now there's a nice way to find these user comments and here's the, here are the Aurora kinase ones. There's more than one Aurora kinase, which is interesting. And we will get back to that, get back to that in a little bit. Okay. Let's keep moving down. Literature taxonomy, I think, again, should not be any surprises. This is coming from the NCBI taxonomy, but it shows you exactly where this particular strain falls under the taxonomy. Uh, so may or may not be of interest to you. And if you click on any of these, it's gonna take you to the NCBI taxonomy browser. There's a section called orthology and symptomy. And this, depending on what you're, what you're interested in and your interests are, this could be a very, very useful section. So uh, two things to note here. One is, this is the orthology group this belongs to. And I'm gonna click on this and open up in a, in a new window. And we'll get to this in a second, but this is loading the group in OrthoMCL that this gene belongs to. Um, and so this could be uh, nice and interesting to explore. I'm also gonna open up this table of orthologs and paralogs in ToxoDB. And you'll quickly see that there are lots of orthologs and paralogs within ToxoDB spanning, you know, everything from uh, Besnosia, Imeria, uh, Sarcosystis, and, uh, and Toxoplasma. Um, this table actually is quite nice for two reasons. One is obviously it shows you where the, the, the orthologs or homologs are. Um, it tells you if that particular strain where it came from is considered a reference strain. It shows you whether these are syntenic or collinear between them. And you'll notice, for example, there is um, uh, like Besnosia, for example, has two aurora or two kinases that are following the same orthology group. So presumably they're both uh, aurora type kinases and one is syntenic and one is not. 
And as you go down, this seems to be a common theme, many of them where there's one syntenic and one is not. And, and so we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. Um, the other information that's available is whether this gene has a user comment from the other gene page, right? Because each of these will have its own gene page. And you can quickly see if somebody added a user comment there. And you can see in the I am area one, there is a user comment. So you may be interested in going to look at it. And the one in, in Neospora, there is a user comment. So you may be interested in going to look at it because there may maybe somebody added information there that's that's potentially useful for, for you if you are working on this specific gene. So you'll notice here that there are little boxes here that you can select these genes. And at the bottom here, you can run a quick cluster omega alignment. So let's go ahead and try that. So I'm gonna go ahead and take, I'm gonna take these two Bisnoitia aurora kinases. Um, let's take these two um, uh, cyclos cyclospora aurora kinases. Um, let's move down and take these two um, uh, Cystois uh, sospora aurora kinases. Here's an Imeria one. Let's pick, make sure we're picking the right, um, the same uh, species. I'll pick these two. Um, let's keep moving down. And so obviously you can move down and do it like I'm doing right now, or we can also start filtering and say, well, let's find MB49. Uh, so it automatically includes the gene page, the gene we're looking at. And then we're gonna add the second one because uh, MB49 also has a second one. Let's pick Neospora. Here are two Neospora, let's pick these two. I don't know which ones are better, doesn't matter. And let's pick um, Sarcosystis. And so here are two more. And so we've picked now a bunch of uh, uh, proteins that we want to align with each other. And I'm gonna run this cluster alignment. Just gonna open a page. This may take a few seconds, so we'll, we'll let it run. Um, so while it's running, I'm going to go back here to the uh, to ToxoDB, and you'll notice that we, um, we, we we're back to our table, and there's an orthology group. Um, and so let me quickly check and see if this is done, and then we'll be done. Okay, so it is done. So here's our quick alignment, and you can scroll down and look at the alignment, and you'll see that um, uh, you know it's it's variable depending on where you are. Remember, we had looked like we had two classes of aurora kinases, ones that were syntenic and ones that weren't. So this may be interesting. Um, so, but from the alignment, it's obviously hard to tell. I'm gonna go up to the top of the page and you'll notice here you can view this phylogenetic in a phylogenetic tree. Um, and so I'm gonna open this. This is, opens up in the, the um, uh, um, interactive tree of life. And <clears throat> what you can quickly notice here is that these aurora kinases broke into two into two clades. This is a, just a very quick and dirty uh, phylogeny. Obviously, I wouldn't I wouldn't um, uh, bet too much on this, except to give you a quick and dirty view of this. Not surprisingly, in this case, uh, there are two clades of aurora kinases, and you know, and 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 I bet you some of these are going to be this, the ones that are syntenic with each other, and the other ones were the ones that were not syntenic with the particular aurora kinase we're looking at. So this is not terribly surprising, but um, kind of a nice way for you to quickly look at the structure of these uh, of these genes in a particular um, uh, for a particular gene. Okay, so uh, quickly when I took this and I clicked on the the orthology group. So if we look at it here, this is the orthology group in OrthoMCL. You'll see here that this contains 1,199 genes. This is equivalent to a gene page in OrthoMCL. This is the, the group page, basically. Um, and there's a lot of information here that's useful. We do have a webinar that was completely dedicated to OrthoMCL, so I would encourage you to take a look at it as well. But uh, very quickly here, you can now look at the phylogeny of this, or the distribution, phyletic distribution of this gene, this uh, homologs of this gene across the tree of life, pretty much. So between bacteria and various eukarya, and so you can see that this is it's, it's present in many places, and you may want to explore these further. So if you look at the alveolates, apicomplexa, and uh, uh, the coccidia, where toxoplasma is, you can see the, the number of times this gene appears. Um, but then you may be interested in looking, well, what about plasmodium? Uh, oh, plasmodium right here. And so now you can look in plasmodium and see what it looks like. It looks like, in general, there are two copies of this gene, maybe three sometimes, in, in plasmodium. And so that's that's gives you a quick, again, a quick view of, um, of the phylogenetic distribution of this gene. Okay, let's keep moving down. So another section here is called syntony. And so what we do here is we align the uh, nucleotide sequence between uh, the genomes in the database. 
Um, and then wherever there is orthology between the, uh, the genes, uh, we shade them with gray. So this shading here indicates that these are all orthologs. And again, I'm not gonna delve into this in too much detail. You can view this in the, in the genome browser, uh, but you can click on any of these and get more information. So you can see these are all the various toxoplasma strains. So this is not surprising. And then moving down, you might find other organisms that are a bit more distantly related. So here's Hamandia, for example. And you can quickly try and, and, and think about, well, what does the structure of the, um, the organization of the genome uh, in this particular region look like? And you can zoom out a bit more um, to get a, bit, a better feel of what this looks like. And so you can see that there is, there is definitely syntony between um, the genomes within uh, the database most of them. There are a couple of genomes here in the middle which look very different, and so we may both be interested in looking. So Cyclospora looks a bit different. I think that's not surprising, and I would expect that Imeria would be there in there somewhere as well. Uh, we may not even have them showing on, on this view right here. Um, but in general, between all of these, there looks like to be uh, good collinearity or syntony between, uh, between these genomes. Okay, so moving down. If we have phenotype data, there's a phenotype section and you can open it up and it looks like we do. So this was a CRISPR screen where all the genes in the toxoplasma genome were, were knocked out in the Sebastian Laredo lab. And there's a graph that shows you the distribution of all the genes in the genome. They're basically ranked from um, uh, based on their phenotype score. Uh, and so there are over whatever, 8,600 genes or something in the toxoplasma genome. And so they're just ordered by their, by their phenotype score. And so the, the ones that had a lower phenotype score are down, are, are down here, and the ones with a higher phenotype score are up here. And, and based on the publication, the ones that fell up here were dispensable, and the ones that fit, fell down here were uh, affected fitness. And then you can see that our aurora kinase is falling somewhere in the middle, and so it's probably affecting fitness, but maybe not as bad as much as the genes that are down here. One thing to keep in mind, of course, with any of these experiments, you have to sort of think about where, where was this experiment done? What, uh, you know, can I learn more about this experiment? Because that could affect your conclusions. So for example, if you're interested in, um, in the cat stages of the parasite, or the, in this case for, for toxoplasma, um, and this experiment was done in the tachyzoid stages, which are not the cat stages, then maybe this result is, does not apply to your stage. Right? In fact, it, it may not apply to your stage, and it's something you have to keep in mind. For each experiment, we do have a full description, and so we can we can open this up in a new play in a new page. And if we go here, it opens up a uh, what's called our data set description page. This includes a link to the publication, uh, who provided the data, um, a description of the experiment. This is a figure from the paper, uh, and so you can get a lot more information about this. So if you're trying having a hard time understanding how to read the graph, definitely go to the description uh, of this experiment. You might find sufficient information here. And if this is not enough, then you can go to the paper and learn, learn more about it. And um, uh, you know, if we have a search against this data, you can go, we have, we provide you with the link to the search right here. So for example, identify genes based on CRISPR phenotype. So we were looking at a single gene, but maybe you decide, well, I wanna find all the genes that have a low CRISPR score in the toxoplasma genome. You can, can do this right here by, by running the search and it opens up the search, which allows you to configure the phenotype scores that were on the graph basically and get all the genes that met this uh, phenotype score. Okay, let's keep moving down. Genetic variation, basically anytime we have uh, uh, genomes, isolates that were sequenced in the database, we can align them back to the reference genome and then call the polymorphisms that occur. And so you can, here's our Aurora kinase gene, uh, and you'll see all of these diamonds. Each one of these diamonds indicates a single nucleotide polymorphism. Um, and if you click on these, you're not sure what these colors are. If you click on this, so it looks like the yellow ones are non-coding uh, SNPs. If we click on the dark blue ones, you'll see here it's a coding non-synonymous. So non-synonymous is a change in the nucleotide that's changing the amino acid sequence. And then the light blue ones are probably gonna be the synonymous ones, right? So the changes in the nucleotide that are not changing the amino acid sequence. So typically the ones that are dark blue are the ones you would, you would maybe care more about. You can, you know, anytime you click on these, it tells you um, uh, the frequency of these SNPs, what the major allele was, what the minor allele was. So you can see here very quickly that the majority of the, uh, this is the reference. So it was a, a C in the um, uh, nucleotide sequence and then the amino acid was an S, uh, serine. And so you can see the majority of the isolates also had the same sequence. 
But then there's a, a small minority of isolates that had a, a nucleotide change that resulted in a cysteine instead of a serine here. And so again, depending on what you're interested in, you may want to go explore these further. And we have a record page for SNPs. I won't go there, but it's a whole record page that describes this particular polymorphism, and you can see all the isolates and where they came from. Let's move down. There's sort of summary information, so you can very quickly see that this gene had a total of 287 SNPs in it, um, and uh, 153 of them were non-synonymous. To me, that seems like a very high number of non-synonymous SNPs in here, and it may or may not be, depending on the organism, and so this would be um, potentially of interest. Let's move down. Um, there's a transcriptomic section. So here we can start understanding more about where this gene is expressed. And you'll notice here there are three subsections. One section is the RNA, uh, RNA-seq transcriptome transcription summary. Let's open this. So what this does, it's going to open up a graphical represent representation of all the RNA-seq experiments that we have in the database. Um, and this is, they are, uh, all we're doing here is we're showing you for each experiment, which is a row in this graph, um, each dot is a sample in that experiment. Um, and, uh, and then the, the X axis is the, either the log of, uh, two of the, uh, uh, transcripts per million, or you can just look at the transcripts per million themselves. The point of this is, is really to give you a quick way to see if there are any experiments where there's a big difference between the expression of this gene and the different samples, right? So for example, this experiment right here, which um, uh, is, is showing you, uh, you know, some parasites treated with, with something, I don't know what they're treated with, some kind of a drug, doesn't, doesn't really matter. But you'll see here that the change in this aurora kinase is not a lot between any of the treatments, right? So maybe not an interesting experiment to look at. Um, and you can see there are many experiments that sort of there's there's no really not a big dynamic range between. But then they have this experiment right here, where you see that wow there's a big difference. And if I click on this, you can see the samples. There's this FZ sporozoid compared to sporozoids compared to tachyzoids with FZ sporozoids. So right now I don't know anything about this experiment, but I do know that there is a big difference between the expression of this gene um, in the different samples. So I would be interested in exploring this experiment a little bit more. So I'm going to scroll down to our transcript expression section, which includes all the expression data. Notice that it's not only RNA-seq, there's also microarray data, which is not represented in the summary graph above, but uh, you can explore these as well. But then there's the RNA-seq experiment. And remember, I'm interested in this experiment from, from uh, the Gutter lab, so Pascal Gutter, And I want to go in here, and I can try and look for it by scrolling down here and finding it, or I can uh, simply just filter by uh, the name of, uh, of this person, Pascal's name, and now it takes me to an experiment. I can expand it, and now it shows me, first of all, if you look at the name of the experiment, it tells me that this is a, a dual RNA sequence, right? So they must have done a parasite and the host, and it looks like they did this in rat intestinal epithelial cells. So that's interesting. So I'll be interested in knowing, oh, I wonder if the, if the host is responding differently. And you'll see here, here's the frozen sporozoid. There's no no expression. Okay, well, it turns out that's maybe not surprising, right? They're frozen sporozoids. So, so maybe this is not, not, not terribly surprising. Okay, so that's okay. I can look at this. I can go again to the full uh, description of this experiment and look at it here. You can get more information. Um, and this is where you'll find out that, oh yeah, this turns out they're frozen sporozoids and then they mix the frozen sporozoids with, with tachyzoids and, and or sporozoids and looked at the change in expression in the host cell. So maybe they're, my main goal here was to look at host cell changes. Um, and so maybe really what I'm interested in is, is learning about the host cell expression changes. And we saw that there's a maybe a big difference between the frozen sporozoids and the, the sporozoids themselves. That would be an, an, um, a good question to ask. So I can quickly from here, we have an associate data set section. I'm gonna go ahead here and go to host DB to this particular experiment and what will happen now takes me to the data set page in HostDB. It looks the same, right? It's the same data set. But now I'm going to scroll down here and I'm going to run a search for differential expression. And this is this experiment. I've already tried this before just to make sure it works, but I'm, I'm going to compare the sporozoids to the frozen sporozoids. And I'm going to look for any rat gene, basically, that's uh, differentially regulated when I compare uh, live sporozoids to frozen sporozoid infection. And then you can get answer. And it shows me that there are 22 genes that met this criteria, and then you can explore them further.
Okay, so there's a very nice way where you can now link between uh, different databases and look at the expression of genes across different databases. Okay, so let's stop here. I'm gonna say, okay, and then, uh, you know, the nice thing about this filter table is you can now look for other types of experiments. For example, if I'm looking, if I'm interested in, um, in uh, the cat stages, I can start typing feline. And here you'll notice there, there are two experiments that include the word feline in them. And here's one that shows you the, the full um, transcriptome across the entire life cycle of toxoplasma, including the cat stages, these enteroepithelial stages. Um, the cool thing, what you'll notice is that this gene, aurora kinase, is most highly expressed in tagazoids. Um, and, and that maybe should not be surprising because aurora kinases are, are important in cell proliferation. So that, that seems to uh, fit. All right, so I'm going to collapse this. And now you'll notice here this user data set section. So if you are on this gene page, you will not have a user data set section unless you loaded some data. And so in this case, I've actually exported data from our Galaxy um, interface. So under tools, you'll see we have Galaxy here. We have webinars and, and exercises on our Galaxy interface and how you can export data back to uh, ViewPathDB resources. In this case, I compared you know, I just got this data from the sequence read archive. I did the analysis in Galaxy, in our Galaxy instance, and then I exported the results into um, ViewPathDB. And you can see here that in my experiment or the experiment I loaded, the, uh, this Aurora kinase is uh, more highly expressed in the tachyzoids compared to the uh, cysts. And that should not be surprising. We already saw this result from this other experiment right here, right? And so here's a tissue cyst, here's a tachyzoid, and you can see that it's more highly expressed in the tachyzoid. So that's good when things things match up like that. I'm gonna keep going down. Um, again, transposable elements, there, were, there, there will not be any here, but in certain organisms, you will have that. Uh, alignments, this is a genome browser view where we align uh, the NCBI results uh, then, uh, from the non-redundant database, but also we align uh, express sequence tags. So again, you may, be, may or may not be interested in this, but I would encourage you to explore this. The actual sequence for this particular gene is available here. So you can see under sequences, there's the predicted protein sequence and you can load more. You can see the whole predicted protein sequence. Um, there's the predicted um, RNA with the UTRs. So you can see the UTRs here are highlighted in, in, in pink in this case. So Y prime and three prime, and then the gene itself, the coding sequence, which should start with an ATG typically. You can see it right here. And so we'll keep scrolling down. Um, Structure similarity, you'll see here we have similarity to uh, the protein data bank. And this shows you any similarities based on BLAST right here. So I'm going to quickly jump to another gene page. In this case, I'm going to jump to a gene page in PlasmoDB because we also loaded um, um, uh, data from AlphaFold. For this particular one, there isn't an AlphaFold structure, uh, and so or maybe it wasn't loaded. So I'm going to go ahead and go to this PlasmoDB gene page. I picked the, the hydrofold reductase gene. And I, in my menu here, I just type the word alpha, it shows me the alpha fold section. And then right here, I can quickly take a look at this uh, and look at this gene. And you can see that there are regions of this uh, gene that are that are really highly conserved. Not surprising, obviously, for, for the hydrofold reductase, time-related synthetase, this gene is, is a highly conserved metabolic enzyme. And so, um, you know, whether it's alpha fold or not, you should be able to predict its structure based on similarity to other to other structures. But alpha fold does a nice job, obviously here. Um, okay, so the other section I'm going to jump to before, because I know we're getting uh, close to the top of the hour. Remember, we were looking in the transcriptomic section, and this was all bulk RNA seq data. Um, but we also are integrating uh, single cell data. So I'm going to jump to uh, TritripDB. So I'm here on this gene page. Um, I jumped to the um, to the gap DH gene because I, I know it's differentially expressed between the the slender and the stumpy forms of the of the parasite. I went down to the transcriptomic section, or actually I just searched for single in the menu here, and now it shows me single RNA seq data. I went to this section, and here you get a UMAP plot, a projection of of the of all the cells. So these are not this is not expression values, but these are all the cells that were in the experiment, and they're clustering based on the expression of all the genes that were assayed um, in that cell, basically. Um, and so you can see, you can interact with this. I can quickly look at where this, this, um, uh, where this gene is most highly expressed. So if I look at the region where there's um, the highest expression levels, and you can see it looks like these two clusters is where uh, there are cells that are highly expressing uh, this gap DH gene. 
Um, and so if you want to interact with this further, you can explore this data in our cell by gene um, um, app. So we didn't develop this, obviously. This is uh, developed by the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, but uh, we take advantage of it. It's a very nice tool. And so we load the RNA sequence data here. This is the same cluster we were looking at on the gene page. Right now it's not colored, but I can color it by clusters. So you can see here, they seem to have identified four clusters. You may wonder, well, I wonder what these, these clusters are. So you can um, annotate the categories. And so you can see that these were the slender forms and these are the stumpy forms, right? So now, uh, you know, working with the gene page board, I can quickly see, oh, okay, these were the slender forms and GAPDH dh is known to be um, differentially regulated uh, between the slenders and the stumpies. So this is not a surprising result. Okay, let's go back to the Aurora kinase gene page. So hopefully we've covered enough of the transcriptomes, the sequence is available here, um, uh, the structure. So we have a protein features and properties section. Um, and so this section includes uh, a protein browser, which shows you any of the protein attributes that we have. These will include uh, the, the hydropathy plot, um, all the intrapro domains. So if there were any intrapro domains available for this gene, they will be highlighted here. So the, the, the gene is basically, or the protein is basically this whole view right here. And you can click on any of these and look at them. And so this has a protein kinase-like uh, domain. Okay, that's great. It's a Aurora kinase. And so you'd expect it to have a kinase domain. And so you can click on these. So any of these uh, domains from the different um, databases are, are showing you there. So you can see Intraproscan shows that it has a, a, a domain called the Aurora kinase domain. And so that's cool. So now we can, we know that in addition to the name of the gene, we have other evidence that suggests it's an Aurora kinase. So that's that's good. Um, we can keep scrolling down. Um, so uh, you we have some quick links where you can um, run additional searches on your gene. So for example, you can blast your gene against the NR database uh, or select the database you want to blast it against right here. And it just sends the, the sequence directly to the database. You can look for GPI anchors. Um, you can um, you can look at the intraproscan domains right here in a table format. This is the same that we were looking at in the in the uh, view over there. But you can also run your sequence against intrapro, run a fresh run because we run these um, our genomes through uh, all of these analyses once at some point in the history of this genome, and then maybe every few years. It doesn't happen automatically all the time because it's it's a huge huge effort to do that or computationally very expensive. These don't change dramatically, especially for conserved genes like this one. Um, but it's always nice to maybe run it again in case there's some new domain or there's some some change in the algorithm that makes maybe the confidence in these domains less or more. So that's kind of interesting or nice. Uh, and we have additional things like Mitoprot, uh, 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 String Database, Wolf P sort. So these are all things that you can run directly from the gene page and, and uh, set them up. Um, there's a, we have a data set called the, the Hyperlopid data set from ToxidoB. For this particular gene, there's no data, so there's nothing to show you right here. So we'll keep moving down. Function prediction, if this gene has enzyme commission numbers, we provide them um, and we tell you where this is coming from. Um, we also provide you with the go terms, so you can see the go terms and where they're coming from. So for example, this has a protein phosphorylation go term, which is not surprising. Uh, it has an ATB binding go term, which is also not surprising for an Aurora kinase. As you move down, you'll see here metabolic pathways. So if there are metabolic pathways where this enzyme is, or this gene is associated with, it'll show up here. Um, and you can explore these further. So each one of these, if you open it up, it's gonna open up a, a metabolic pathway page in ToxoDB where it, that you can explore. Um, and then we have a proteomic section. So this shows you the mass spec evidence that's available. These are from real experiments. And so you can quickly take a look if there was any, um, if there were any peptides identified from different experiments, and you can see that yes, there are multiple peptides here that are from different experiments. And then there's also post transitional modification data. I, I bet you this is going to be some kind of phosphorylation, I'm guessing. Um, and so it looks like yes, it's a phosphoproteome, and it looks like that these positions here are potentially phosphorylated. Um, and then you can you can see this in a table as well, and you can see uh, the type of phos uh, modification, that's phosphorylation site, and whether it's a serine, a threonine, or a tyrosine. And so that's kind of nice. Um, we have quantitative mass spec. So if there is data for quantitative mass spec, there isn't an experiment for this case. Uh, so there's no data, but it'll show up as a graph like the RNA-seq data. And then finally, we have epitope mapping. If there are any, then you can uh, you can explore it here. Going to jump up to the top of the gene page. 
and just show you that you can also download the results. So I can very quickly say, well, I want to download this gene with all the information that's available. So I can either uh, select um, the columns. So these are all the tables that are in a gene page and I can download them, or I can just download the FASTA sequence of this gene. I can say, I just want the protein and it gives me the exact protein, or I can actually select the genomic sequence and I can configure exactly what sequence. So let's say I want the upstream sequence for this. You can actually configure it right here. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. It's the top of the hour. Um, I don't think there were any questions, but if there are any questions, I'll, I'll hold on for maybe 10 seconds or so. If there are questions, feel free to type them. <clears throat> and as usual, if um, often, you know, after a webinar, people say, oh, I, I had a question, but I didn't ask it. And, and so don't worry about it. Just click on the contact us link and just let us know, say, I attended this webinar and I was confused about something you explained or I have additional questions and feel free to ask them and, and we're more than happy to answer them. Okay, with that, uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining. Uh, this webinar has been recorded. Uh, you will get a link uh, by tomorrow uh, with the webinar recording, and it'll be available on our YouTube channel and, of course, in our in our webinar page and all of our resources. Again, everything I showed you today will be applicable to any of the ViewPathDB resources. Uh, so please explore your gene of interest uh, to learn more about it on the gene pages. Thank you very much, and uh, see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.